Today we'll be talking about the top 10 role-playing mistakes you're probably making. And if you're not and you're upset about this false accusation, then, you know, scream at me in the comments. It's all good. Number one, calling it role-playing. If you clicked on this video thinking that role-playing refers to the talky-talky bits in the game, you know, where the characters are talking with NPCs or among themselves, especially talking in character with special voices or accents, well then the following rant is for you. And if you're a regular viewer, you already know what is coming, but I guarantee you, it'll still be entertaining. But for everyone else who refers to the talky talky bits of the game talking in character as role playing, well, guess what? That's not role playing. That's that is a tiny bit of role playing, but the entire game is role playing. The entire game, the combat, the exploration, social interactions, when you're opening doors, when you're looking for traps, when you're finding secret doors, when you're fighting enemies, when you're talking to enemies, when you're talking to shopkeepers, all of that is role playing. The entire game is role playing. The talky talky bits where you're using special voices and talking with a ridiculous dwarven accent, that, yes, is role playing, but that's not all that is role playing. That is one small part of role playing that we usually refer to as social interactions. So please stop calling it role playing. The, the whole game is role playing. However, the good news for you is that this video is actually about the talky talky stuff and how to improve social interactions in your role playing game. So even if you erroneously believe that talky talky is the only thing that is involved with role playing, well, this video is still for you. I'm still gonna tell you a whole bunch of different things to improve your talky talky bits in your games. And number two, planning out dialogue word for word. That, that's a mistake, by the way. It's a mistake that I've seen game masters do. They have read aloud text for dialogue. In fact, I have seen modules, adventures, pre-made adventures that have like, you know, boom, a whole massive bit of read aloud text that's supposed to be for an NPC dialogue. Like you're supposed to read that to your characters, to your players as the NPC talking. Don't, don't do that. that that is forced and unnatural. Read aloud text is good, is best used for descriptions. It's it's not ideal for conversations, not, not for real conversations. Instead, what you want to know is the NPC's motivations, their desires, and their fears. Now, for motivations and desires, knowing what motivates an NPC, what they want, helps you decide what they will say and do. The trick here is to let the NPC's motivation drive the social interaction scene and improvise dialogue based on what the NPC's motivations and goals are. You don't need a script. You don't need read aloud text for the NPC's dialogue, what they're going to say. Instead, allow their motivations and goals to inform what they do and say. Also, look at their fears. What is the NPC afraid of? This all also determines what they will say and do. Okay, examples, let's look at your typical city guard. You know what your city guard wants to do? Well, your city guard doesn't want to fight adventuring parties. They don't wanna to have to bear steel. What they really wanna do is they wanna get home alive and go home to their wife and kids. Blacksmiths. Well, you know, blacksmiths might just be afraid of adventuring parties who often use violence and intimidation to get what they want. In fact, a couple years ago, they heard about a rival blacksmith who got killed over some horseshoes. Now, of course, they were a rival, so their death was actually kind of a boon to their business. But, you know, still, point stands. Adventuring parties can be dangerous. Look at your typical evil villain. Let's say that this one wants to accomplish a goal of justice on the village that executed his father and exiled his mother and him when he was very small. And now you got these characters, your party's players, your, your, your player's characters who are trying to stop him. Well, that doesn't sit well with him and he's going to get rid of them. And you also want to know how well educated the character is because that will influence how they talk and their word choice, but it will also influence how they react to others of different educational levels. Do they respond poorly if they feel like they're being talked down to, or do they admire people who are better educated than they are? If you know all of these things about your NPCs, improvising dialogue is a whole lot easier. By the way, if you're a new game master looking for guidance and information to help you figure out this whole GMing business, then you should check out my Secret Art of Game Mastery Kickstarter. You will get over 250 pages of Game Master advice, 
knowledge, and wisdom to elevate your role-playing game. The Secret Art of Game Mastery has over 100 years of accumulated experience from me and my team distilled into an easy to use reference guide. You can get better at running any game, any system, and any genre, whether you're a new game master or veteran. For instance, you'll learn the core pillars of RPGs, how to create campaigns and adventures that will engage your players, how to handle problem players, what to do before your game and after, the fundamentals of creating awesome maps, and more. Furthermore, in the two companion books, The Secret Art of Preparation and The Secret Art of Note-Taking, you'll get the same templates I use in my own games to help me create and run amazing campaigns and adventures for my players. Get more information and back the Kickstarter at the link below. Number three, not acting as the NPC. When you're role-playing an NPC, you need to act as the NPC. Describe how an NPC says something and not just what they say. Even better, don't describe how they say it, actually do it you yourself as you're sitting there in your game master chair. Standing, a lot of us like to stand too. And here's the second thing you want to know about every NPC, their mannerisms. Mannerisms are how they act, their visual tics, body language, their posture, their facial expressions, hand movements, things like wringing their hands, adjusting rings on their fingers and eye that is always twitching. <laughs> and then you portray those things during the game, during the conversation. If you act out an NPC's mannerisms while also allowing their motivations to organically drive the conversation, your NPCs will be much better and the social interaction scene will be far smoother, more natural, and more enjoyable for everyone game master and players. Also consider simple things like referencing places that the NPC has been or things from their past, such as when I was an apprentice in Alheim's smithy or I stopped adventuring when a necromancer killed the rest of my party and I ran away terrified. And here's a GM shortcut for you. Picture a character from pop culture or a performer that you know well and imitate their attitudes, their way of speaking and their gestures. And a note on the ridiculous. For whatever reason, players often have their characters say or do ridiculous things in social interaction scenes. Don't let this throw you off. You're still just role-playing the NPC. Consider how the NPC would react and then just do it. Remember, there is nothing wrong with saying no to the ridiculous if that is the tone of your game. Number four, not using unique voices for NPCs. I am not talking about being the world's best voice actor. I'm not that great myself. I still do the best I can. And I know this can be something that's uncomfortable for some game masters as well. However, using a different voice when you speak in character as an NPC is yet another thing that elevates social interactions. And don't worry about replicating real world accents. I try to do a Scottish Dwarven accent, but I'm horrible at it. One of the things you can do instead is just change the tone of your voice, the verbiage that you use, or the slang that you use. For example, when I talk as the wizard, I just have this haughty sound to my voice. I tip my head a little bit and I try to use big words that show off my education. I don't know if there are any big words there, but I'm just changing the way I talk, my mannerisms, just slightly. I'm not doing anything super fancy or special for the wizard. And the barbarian just talks like this, you know, and he gets a little bit goofy and he has weird facial expressions that happen a lot, and I'm just changing my voice. I'm not really trying to replicate a real world accent or anything. I don't even. I don't even know if I know any real world accents. Number five, not practicing before the game begins. Something that I sometimes do before my games is I literally play out a conversation between one of my NPCs and the player's characters. Sometimes I'm in front of a mirror, I might be brushing my teeth. That's hard actually to play out a conversation while you're brushing your teeth. I might be shaving. I might be doing something, I don't know. I'm doing something else, but I'm playing out a conversation. I'm practicing my NPC. I'm practicing the mannerisms that I'm gonna use, the voice, the body tics, but I'm also practicing what the NPC might say based on their motivations and goals. And I imagine what the players might say, and then I role play those things out myself. This practice conversation is almost never what actually happens at the game, but it helps me get in character and understand the NPC better. This prepares me to do the real thing at the game table. By the way, if you're finding this information useful, please give me a thumbs up and share this video with others. One of the best ways you can help other game masters is by sharing helpful content. And you know, if you're a player, 
whose game master needs this content, you could just kind of discreetly share it with them. Oh, by the way, you might be interested in this. And if you're a game master watching this because one of your players shared it with you, well, now you know why. Number six, not preparing NPCs in advance. When possible, and especially for important NPCs, prepare them in advance. Have a card with a few notes about the characters, such as what they want, what they fear, and what motivates them, and what won't work on them, their general personality, and how the game master should stand or sit talk or act while role-playing the character. One of the things that we do in our publications such as Lair Magazine is that we have specific notes about NPCs that is supposed to help the game master run them at the game table. Another thing you can do as well is note a phrase that the NPC often uses such as, well, since you asked, or come think about it, or so they say, catchphrases. The point here, catchphrases, are a great way to get into a character's head and portray them at the game table. And when your player's characters interact with an NPC you didn't prepare in advance, often because they went somewhere or decided to talk to someone unexpected, there are two alternatives to improvisation. The first is creating a warehouse of NPCs in advance that you can pull out and use, or buy pre-made NPCs. You can either make them yourself or you can buy ones that are already done. There are actually NPC cards available on Amazon that I've found helpful at times, even if I usually forget to use them and they just sit on my shelf right there. And certain issues of Lair Magazine have pre-made NPCs in them also that you can drag and drop into your games. Number seven, having all NPCs be suspicious or hostile to the characters. I don't know why this is a thing, but it seems to be a reoccurring theme I see in games and it makes no sense at all. It's not realistic at all for every NPC that the characters meet to be hostile or suspicious. I mean, unless the characters are infamous and they're criminals or something or this they just plain shady it's possible that the characters have established a reputation of doing horrible things to people I, I don't know but if all of your npcs are hostile or appear like they don't want to be bothered it's gonna get old for your players and fast. Instead, change up NPCs, starting attitudes and personalities. Also, remember that most NPCs in service industries, you know, your local shopkeeper, they at least want to appear welcoming and friendly. After all, they're trying to get customers to buy stuff. If your NPCs take everything personally and get more hostile or aggressive, no matter what the characters say, that doesn't create an atmosphere where players want to interact with NPCs. Changing things up keeps NPCs interesting and engaging. Number eight, forgetting to breathe. Sometimes you might freeze up or panic when playing an NPC. This might happen, for instance, when you're role-playing a clever, quick-witted NPC when you're not as mentally agile as the NPC is. So breathe, take your time, remember, as the game master, you control the pace of the game. You control the flow of time. And even if you have to think about a response for a moment or two, you can still make the response seem immediate by saying something like, the innkeeper immediately replies. Even though it took you, the game master, a few moments to think of a response, you can still, in the narrative, in the fiction, portray it as being an immediate response. And never forget, you can always take a bathroom break to give yourself time to think. You know, it might get weird if like you get up and take bathroom breaks every like two minutes, but you know, it's like that guy's gotta, gotta stop drinking coffee. Ah, uh, but it's so good. This is actually tea. I got tea today. Number nine, not finding inspiration elsewhere. If you wanna create an awesome NPC, look at other mediums where you can be inspired. Books, movies, comics, etc. cetera. Oh, wait, are we not supposed to call them comics anymore? Are we supposed to call them like graphic novels? Is calling them comics insulting or something? I don't know, I might. Might be screwing that up. <laughs> anyway, if you wanna do something like build a clever, quick-witted NPC, you can research famous people like Groucho Marx, Jimmy Carr, Winston Churchill, Bill Hicks, and other historical people and comedians known for their wit. YouTube is a great resource for this. Just search comedian and heckler. Remember that there is a difference between wit and trolling. Famous witty people are a good resource for wit. 
Twitter and YouTube comment sections rarely are. Name calling is the worst form of wit. Turning someone's words against them, now that's wit. And as for turning someone's words against them, a lot of times you can just let the player's words be their own comeback. Just focus on your facial expressions like raised eyebrows, eye rolls, and yawning. Number 10, not establishing limits. Consider what is and what isn't possible when characters interact with NPCs. Players will often try to influence NPCs. Merchants and monsters are the most common targets of this. However, there are some things that NPCs just won't do no matter what. And no matter how high the players roll on their dice, it's not gonna matter. They're just not gonna do it. For instance, the characters are never going to get a shop owner to give them something of great value for free. A loyal house guard for a powerful noble who has been on the Lord's staff for decades isn't going to rush out of the house to help someone in need unless that person is somehow related to their Lord's family. A barmaid raised in a society that is under constant threat of war with orcs isn't going to be seduced by a high charisma half-orc character, no matter how high they roll. Remember, if players are role-playing their interactions, their attitudes and words matter. Just like with real-world social interactions, if the characters are being hostile or aggressive with their words, persuasion-based skills aren't likely to be very persuasive. Might have to use intimidation or something like that instead. Also remember, Different people react to intimidation in different ways. Successful attempts to intimidate could help the players get information or get NPCs to do something they might not otherwise do, but it is not mind control. Intimidation can be met with answers, but it could also just cause an NPC to give false information just to save themselves from whatever threat is being levied against them. Or it might cause a particularly hostile NPC to fight back and shift a scene from social interaction to combat. But those are just my tips for role-playing NPCs and creating awesome social interactions. What do you think? Let us know how you make social interactions memorable in your game. Also, so don't forget to check out our Secret Art of Game Mastery Kickstarter at the link below. There are only a few weeks left to back the project. Okay, so having strong NPCs is a great start toward running a great game for your players. But what if you want to improve another pillar of RPGs, exploration? In that case, check out this video right here where I discuss how you can create a point of interest system for your games. And until next time, happy game mastering.